From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today, we look at homeschooling and how past research may provide some guidance for the millions of families now teaching and learning at home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So there are all sorts of ways that the context is not the same, but at the same time, I think there are things that we can draw from the experiences of homeschoolers and what we know about some of the ways that it works well and some of the ways in which homeschool parents have learned to navigate that context. We welcome Robert Kunzman, the Martha Lee and Bill Armstrong Chair for Teacher Education at Indiana University Bloomington and Managing Director of the International Center for Home Education Research. Kunzman shares some insights gathered from more than 15 years of study in the homeschooling field. Certainly, even in that context, I would suggest that the best uh, parents as instructors are those that pay close attention to what students are exploring. So, you know, when a student's interested in a topic like race cars, for instance, are there ways that I can get them to learn some of the science behind it? And some key takeaways for families across the country. This is what, week two, three, or four of learning for many, not only students at home, but parents trying to figure this out. So they shouldn't expect that they're going to have a masterful touch at this point. But it might be something to think about is the ways in which they can be present and be involved and ask really good questions, but also provide their children with an opportunity to develop their own sense of interest and motivation as they go along. That's right now on Research Minutes. And welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Miller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Robert Kunzman, the Martha Lee and Bill Armstrong Chair for Teacher Education at Indiana University Bloomington. He has spent more than 16 years studying the various philosophies, policies, and practices of homeschooling, and he authored the 2009 book, Write These Laws on Your Children, Inside the World of Conservative Christian Homeschooling. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. I'm glad to be with you. So, We're talking today at a truly unprecedented time in American education where millions of students are temporarily or in many cases for at least the rest of the school year learning at home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. While many districts are offering some form of online instruction in a number of communities, including right here where I am in Philadelphia, districts are actually prohibiting graded remote coursework out of concerns for student equity. So as someone who's studied homeschooling for so long, do you think that there are strategies or lessons families can learn at this moment from the extensive body of research we have in that area? I think there are. I think probably it's worth first noting some of the ways that the current situation and what parents are typically being asked to do at home with their children uh, is different than what we would think of as normally or typically happening in a homeschool context. First of all, most parents who choose to homeschool do so because they think it's going to be a superior or better uh, educational experience for their child. I think in this current situation, obviously, this is what you might call a crisis of last resort for both families and broader society. Uh, It's not something that uh, was made in the ideal context of circumstances. Uh, and there are a lot of ways in which if we think about it, for instance, you know, many students still have working parents, uh, either at home on their computers or even out of the house. Many families are depending upon schools uh, for more than just uh, the three R's. You know, they provide free and reduced meals, special education services, all sorts of ways that learning at home sort of on the spur of the moment has a hard time compensating for. We have a lot of homeschoolers, more than half we know, um, do what we call flexi-schooling. So they're, they're actually also taking classes at local community colleges or even in the local schools or online uh, in ways that you know current students who are home don't necessarily have that opportunity. The homeschoolers are also out in the community and learning co-ops and various extracurricular activities. And those things are obviously all restricted for students at home right now. One of the other issues at play is that in in typical homeschooling, 
uh, we know that around 80% of families have mothers doing all of the instruction. And, and certainly in this current context, it's probably a lot of juggling between different family members. So there are all sorts of ways that the context is not the same. But at the same time, I think there are things that we can draw from the experiences of homeschoolers uh, and what we know about some of the ways that it works well and some of the ways in which homeschool parents have learned to navigate that context. I think probably most fundamentally, something I'm sure we'll get into, is that the homeschooling context provides an enormous amount of flexibility. Uh, and there are ways in which school can be thought of as being done differently than what we think of in, in the traditional context. And in fact, it has to be. Certainly for the students at home uh, right now in this crisis, it has to be as well. So families and stakeholders have expressed concern over the disruption that we're currently seeing, in many cases, probably rightfully so. And they're worrying that extended periods of home instruction could have negative impacts on student learning and achievement. We've seen homeschooling in a traditional sense double since the turn of the century, as you've reported in your own work. In your experience studying that field, uh, are their concerns valid or have you found that families can continue to maintain a level of academic rigor at home? Well, I think certainly the academic achievement results for homeschoolers uh, runs the gamut. And we have plenty of anecdotal reports of uh, homeschool students who achieve at very high levels and certainly are engaged in, in learning of great rigor. I, I think in the current context, it would not surprise me if academic rigor lessened uh, across the board at least a bit. If you think about, for instance, what has happened here? This has been a remarkably abrupt shift. There has been minimal preparation time for schools. Uh, many teachers have had no training with the technology, and they haven't necessarily thought about how their subject would best be translated uh, into an online format if they're doing that. Some subjects, at least as they're currently taught, are certainly less amenable to an online format. So there are ways in which all sorts of compromises will have to be navigated and, and made just the basic learning settings that students are in at home uh, can be really challenging, whether it's technology, whether it's space, whether it's all sorts of other learning environments, and just the emotional stress of the current uh, situation uh, health-wise. I think all those things uh, create a dynamic where we need to, I think, look at this context and, and the opportunities here a little bit more differently and not uh, necessarily demand that the same type of academic rigor and the same type of format and structure be used during this time. So even in those households where students are currently receiving remote instruction, parents are now assuming a much larger and more direct role in their children's education than likely ever before. And most of those parents, I'm sure, have a lot of questions right now. In researching your book, you closely observed six different families and their various approaches to homeschooling children and you've worked for years, obviously, studying nearly every aspect of homeschooling practice and policy. So in your experience, are there some basic fundamental things that families should consider or plan for when designing a strategy for teaching at home? I think there are. I think I would, I would even encourage parents to back up a little bit before the notion of designing a plan and, and just think about their own strengths and weaknesses, um, both in terms of uh, academic material, their interests, uh, the things they like doing, and then just consider the relational dynamics they have with their children. This is a little bit more complex type of scenario. They're not going to just relate to their children as instructors, um, as would happen in a formal school context, but uh, they, they still have that relational background as a parent. And this has both benefits and drawbacks, I think, and, and certainly that's something we see in the homeschool context. Parents know their children extremely well. They know things about them uh, that will provide maybe stronger connections, uh, deeper interest. They know what maybe some of the hot buttons are, relational dynamics to avoid. Um, but those are also sometimes the things that uh, we tend to fall back into, too, when we uh, any parent who you know sits down with their child at night to, to go over homework back when we were having traditional school, uh, knows that that can be a trip, tricky dynamic. And so I think that parents need to think about uh, how they relate to their children and what type of structure they want to put around the learning context, whether it's 
mimicking a formal school setting or whether it's more natural and flowing in terms of uh, letting uh, students sort of explore their own interests as they go along. And then some of it will depend, too, on what, uh, what type of structure schools provide. So for those who are now teaching their, their children from home entirely, and even for those who are supervising their children's remote instruction, as you mentioned, maybe um, assisted or, or sponsored by a school, uh, a common question seems to center on scheduling. In your experience, uh, how should families attempt to plan out a school day? Um, should they mimic the student's existing schedule in some way, or are there more effective approaches that we've seen in research for teaching in a home environment? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that we know from the research is that most homeschoolers, particularly if they're transitioning from a public school context or an institutional school context, parents tend to start out by mimicking that traditional structure and format. And they'll have uh, you know, formal lessons at the kitchen table for set time periods and things like that. And a lot of that has to do with just needing to gain some confidence and familiarity with the material and with the whole dynamic. Um, but what we find is that as time goes on, that these parents, and again, typically mothers, are loosening up their structure, they're being uh, less formal, they are responding more to the moment in terms of uh, students' interests. You know, certainly part of it is knowing your student, knowing your child, and, and learning about what it is that works best for them. You know, some students will just love to spend a, a morning reading one book and just deeply digging into uh, that topic, uh, that story. And that's one of the things about homeschooling that can be really attractive and beneficial is that flexibility is that you could spend all day doing one subject and then you could spend the next day doing a different subject. Uh, you could take uh, short little chunks of time for a subject or a topic that is more complex or difficult or off-putting to a child and think about ways in which you can sort of give it in small doses. So I think that that as parents gain a little bit more comfort and confidence, they should hopefully feel free to do that, obviously within the confines of what the school has set up in terms of requirements. Uh, but I do think that to the extent that the stay-at-home model can be seen as an opportunity for more flexibility and creativity, I think that's a good thing. And I would imagine that's the philosophy that might also apply to striking a balance between, say, direct instruction and allowing for students to have more unsupervised independent learning? I think so. I think that, that you know, the best teachers in any context will, will read their students and will uh, gain an appreciation for how much uh, structure, how much guidance, how much presence is needed by the teacher. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens in probably, we're not really sure, but maybe, you know, Ten uh, percent of homeschooling context is something called unschooling, where there is little to no structure uh, provided by parents, and students are encouraged to explore what's interesting to them. And certainly, even in that context, I would suggest that the best parents, as instructors, uh, are those that pay close attention to what students are exploring and thinking about, well, what are some of the vital basic skills and uh, learning that, that my children need that can organically emerge from this? So, you know, when a student's interested in a topic like, you know, race cars, for instance, are there ways that I can get them to learn some of the science behind it? Can I think about uh, them reading stories that are related to that? I think there are all sorts of ways that that type of learning can emerge organically. And and again, you know, this is this is what week two, three or four of um, learning for many, not only students at home, but parents trying to figure this out. So they shouldn't expect that they're going to have a masterful touch at this point. But it might be something to think about is the ways in which they can be present and be involved and ask really good questions, but also provide their children with an opportunity to develop their own sense of interest and motivation as they go along. One of the overriding questions uh, for nearly all Americans at this point in recent weeks has been, how do we maintain social interaction and connection in such an isolating time? In your experience, have you learned anything or encountered anything, any kinds of approaches families might be able to employ to keep children engaged and connected both socially and educationally when they're learning at home? Yeah, this is a tough one because most of the homeschoolers that I've studied uh, don't stay at home. And uh, that's what we're being asked to do. Most of the homeschoolers 
uh, are out in the community or engaged in learning cooperatives or play groups or extracurricular activities, whether formal or otherwise. And so when we think about needing to be uh, at home, certainly the, the notion of online interaction jumps up as a, as a prime candidate. And there are certainly ways in which uh, the online instruction format will provide for that, but not always. Obviously, families that have siblings uh, around and available, that's, that's helpful. But perhaps family members who are far away and would love the chance to talk and interact online, maybe even read to their younger children in the family. Uh, I can think of a few ways like that, that that we can take advantage of this uh, unstructured time to provide that type of interaction. But at the same time, there's there's clearly a vital piece that will be missing that we really have to sort of just wait out and, and uh, hope that, that this will eventually turn into something that you know, we can get back uh, out in the community again. And are there any other suggestions um, you might have or best practices that you've learned in your years of research that you think might be of use to families during such a difficult time? I, I think that, that one of the sort of fundamental orientations that many homeschoolers have can be useful here, and, and that is that they often recognize maybe more so than a lot of us, the ways that learning happens in so many ways throughout daily life. It doesn't have to all be formal education, so to speak, if we're thoughtful about recognizing those opportunities and the, the many natural questions and curiosities that kids have. Certainly, you know, our, our opportunities to be out and about in the community are quite limited, but, you know, homeschoolers are often turning, you know, grocery store trips into opportunities to do math uh, and think about uh, what they can buy and what they can budget you know, walks in the woods can certainly be ways in which there are, are opportunities for learning, whether it's getting young uh, or any any age child to, to tell a story at the dinner table, to, to maybe write a story and share it with their family. It doesn't have to be part of the formal curriculum, but there are all sorts of ways that we can think of life as education, so to speak, and encourage that type of learning and growth in ways that maybe we hadn't been as oriented to in, in the past as we thought about sending our children off to school, they do their learning there, and then they come home, and then the rest of life is something other than that type of educational experience. And as this is a research-oriented podcast, our final question usually relates to opportunities for future research. I, I can't let you go without asking you about that. Um, do you think that despite the, the tragic circumstances we find ourselves in now, that researchers will be able to learn something from this truly unique period in American education? Well, it's, it is certainly a massive experiment, although maybe not much of a controlled one, in online education. And, and I think there are, there are probably ways that teachers and students will gain you know, familiarity and comfort with the format and figure out ways that they can do it better, figure out what its limitations are, and perhaps that will provide us with more flexibility in the future in thinking about the ways that uh, education can be experienced. But I do think that that broader notion of understanding and appreciating uh, the ways that education happens in so many different contexts and formats, not just in a school building, uh, but we think about all the ways that homeschoolers uh, are out learning in the community and I think schools are, are doing this as well, uh, you know, whether it be internships or different ways that they're connecting outside of the school walls. Those are all things that are sort of becoming more uh, necessary uh, during this time. And so to the extent that researchers can be paying attention to these dynamics, as well as teachers and students themselves, I think that provides some opportunity for learning. I guess the other thing that I would just point out as, as something that Hopefully, we will all gain a deeper appreciation and respect for during this time, and, and certainly to the extent that policymakers can appreciate it, it's important as well, is the profound critical role that, that public schools play in our civic life. They play in, in the, the fabric of our communities. Uh, we, we perhaps notice it most poignantly when they're, when they're not available to us in that way, where students don't have a place to go to get a meal, to be a part of a a community of adults that really looks out for them beyond just their families, and the ways in which uh, many schools provide sort of a heartbeat for a community. I think those are all things that sometimes in our current policy context, um, when we think about simply test scores and um, 
uh, you know, opportunities for the market to prevail, I think we lose track of, of those vital roles. And I think it hits home uh, when we no longer have them available to us. So to the extent that we gain that appreciation, uh, that could be one positive that emerges from this. Robert Kunzman, once again, is the Martha Lee and Bill Armstrong Chair for Teacher Education at Indiana University Bloomington and author of the book, Write These Laws on Your Children, Inside the World of Conservative Christian Homeschooling. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRE Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe, you can visit us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or suggest future topics, you can find us on Twitter at CPRE Hub. That's C-P-R-E 